Welcome everyone from London on behalf of UCL. My name is Monica Lackenpaul. I am Professor of Integrated Child Health and um, UCL Pro Vice Provost for South Asia. It is a huge honor to be here with you all today to chair the session, session five on positive partnerships and assistive technology. If I was to rename this session, what would I call it? I would call it the four Ps. I'm quite known for changing some of the titles of presentations. So why the four Ps? The four Ps because I'd want to call it positive partnerships for the population and with the people. And that's what we're really here to talk about today. Assistive technology, communities and people. Whether it is the morning or the afternoon or the evening for you, I just want to welcome you here because you've kindly given up your time to join us for this very exciting and interactive session, focusing on at least three of the 17 SDGs. So what are those? SDG three, good health and well-being. SDG nine, industry, innovation and infrastructure. And SDG 17, partnerships for the goals. However, as we know, all the SDGs are all as important as each other. So thank you for joining the conference where we've been talking about many of the others. But with this in mind, the aim of this particular session is to discuss how we can develop positive partnerships across the translational pathway. What are the key ingredients and how can partnerships be used to overcome challenges and reach people in communities all over the world? You may ask yourselves, why have we chosen this topic at all? Well, globally, more than 1 billion people need um, one or more assistive technology products such as hearing aids, wheelchairs, prosthesis, and many, many more, to be able to live an independent and dignified life. And this is also fueled by an aging society. So our panel today is diverse, and we're very honored by having them all here today. They're very keen that you all have the opportunity to intera interact with them, share your views, your questions with them, and to begin a dialogue and a journey with us together to take us into the future. It is for this reason that we have extended the session by 30 minutes. We will now be running the session for two hours. And we hope that this means that you'll be able to get a chance to ask us your questions and to have this interactive dialogue with us. It's very important that we share together our views into the future. But without any further ado, I want to introduce this diverse and amazing panel that we have with you today. So the first person who I'd like to introduce is Shona McDonald. Shona McDonald is the founding director of Shona Quip Social Enterprise, a hybrid organization incorporating Uhambo and Champions Network Trust that drives social change towards a more inclusive society using an ecosystem approach to change. This includes locally appropriate and affordable assistive device design, manufacture and provision mobile clinics, and remote telehealth and training. Her life's work and the company's origin were inspired by her daughter, who spurred Shona's lifelong commitment to address the lack of appropriate wheelchair provision for people with mobility problems. Shona is kindly joining us from South Africa today. The next person I'd like to introduce is my colleague Pratik, Pratik Madhav. Pratik is from India, and he is the CEO and founder of the Assist Technology Foundation, ATF for short. ATF has impacted on the lives of over 160,000 people with disabilities and has built a community of 400 plus assistive technology innovators and startups in India. And is now partnering with AT Innovation focused initiatives in seven countries to build a global alliance. A corporate digital technology leader turned happy social entrepreneur, his belief in the ability of technology to make a significant impact encouraged him to give up an 18 year old career in IT industry to focus on promoting disability or assistive technology startups. So thank you Pratik for being with us. And Professor Catherine Holloway, a good colleague of mine from UCL. Catherine is an academic director and co-founder of the Global Disability Innovation Hub, GDI Hub as many of you will know it for. And she's UCL professor of interaction design and innovation. Her research revolves around accessibility and innovation, crossing traditional discipline boundaries 
engineering, transport, rehabilitation, computer science, and entrepreneurship. And as I mentioned, Catherine is our colleague here at UCL in London. And Chapel, Chapel Kasnabas. Thank you so much again for joining us. Chapel is a prosthetics and orthotics engineer. After working 14 years with the government of India, he founded Mobility India in Bangalore in 1994. Since 2003, Chapel has worked with the World Health Organization and currently as head of unit of the a Access to Assistive Technology and Medical Devices Unit of Essential Medicines and Health Products Division of the WHO. Chapel is based in Geneva. And Wendy Walker, thank you, Wendy. It's very, very early in, in America where you are this morning. And um, so thank you for getting up so early to join us. Wendy is the chief of the social development thematic group um, for the sustainable development and climate change department within the Asian Development Bank. Here she leads the team of a technical assistant program on strengthening capacity for developing members capacity in elderly care in six countries in the region. Wendy is based in the Philippines, but is currently in Washington, DC. So thank you again, Wendy. I'm now going to turn to the panelists and our panelists will actually be giving a presentation each for us, followed by which we'll have a poll and then we'll have some questions. I'm going to ask each panelist to give us an introduction to their work. This will start the conversation going. They will talk about how partnerships have shaped and informed the impact of what they do, what their key challenges have been and how they overcame them. So please do participate by using the Q&A tab in the interactive box to the right of your screens. Please also do use social media and Twitter with the hashtag UCL Beyond Boundaries. We're going to start our presentations with the co-founder from South Africa, Shona. Thank you very much, Shona, over to you. Hi, hi to everybody and thanks for, for hosting us. Um, I started Shona Quip or nearly 30 years ago now, in order to build robust ecosystems of support for families of children with disabilities. And one element of this obviously is the design and manufacture of appropriate uh, devices and the provision of really a range of 24 hour posture support devices. Next slide, please. Um, we, we provide a whole range of support services around the child and the family, because we really understood, I think from my own experience as a mother of a child with a severe disability, that the device alone isn't a solution and that we have to really look at building the ecosystem in a way that parents can really reach the, the information and the skills they need to be the knowledge holders of their child's disability themselves. And this can only be done if you touch on many different points in the child's life. So um, our focus point always starts with the barrier to perception and, and um, stigma and the, the, the problems that parents find in the, in the communities around them. And to do this, we have built partnerships around um, establishing a parent champion network, so empowering parents to be the champions of their own children's lives, and linking that to knowledge sharing for professionals in corporates, universities, and particularly students, so that they come out of the universities with an attitude towards knowing that the parent needs to be empowered. And then we also build relationships with other nonprofit organizations, specifically human rights agencies, like the Black Session, Section 27. Another big element of our work is around posture support, which I've already mentioned. And there, our partnerships have really been um, focused on um, strengthening our skills in Southern Africa around wheelchair provision and making sure devices are really appropriate. So we've worked with World Health, with Chapal, um, worked with industry partners and established a medical devices cluster in South Africa that promotes the economy around medical devices and ensures that the government is attuned to budgeting. 
and 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 local production, and also looked obviously at upskilling multiple therapists across the region and um, healthcare providers to ensure that information is disseminated and quality of practice keeps growing. Another big area of our work is in education, where we work with government tenders, promoting early intervention and inclusion of children in early schools and preschools. And then finally, we also provide a lot of support for meaningful work in making sure that corporates are empowered to bring children on, um, adults into workplace and reasonably accommodate them. Next slide. As you can see, our work all intersects and no one part of our work works without the other. And for this to work properly and to really flow, the only solution has to be multiple partnerships. So for our community sensitization, we run our, um, Let's Talk Disabilities. We never run those in isolation from working with parents or students or doctors. They support all our work at multiple levels. We never run wheelchair seating clinics without also including interactions around education and access to education or work stimulation programs where we train people on um, repair and maintenance. To do this again, we've partnered with multiple partners because we don't have the skills alone. And I think that's why um, as we escalate our work, next slide, please. We need to be really aware of how to build partnerships to ensure they're not competitive, they're not territorial, and they definitely don't focus on anybody owning or having control over anything, because ultimately it's the parent and the family that needs that control. Another big element of our work is around research. Without the right information and data, we cannot influence policy. Um, I'm not gonna go through the slide in detail, but I'm sure the slides will be made available to people. But really our role is in looking at what is the reality on the ground with the people we work with. For example, does the child have the chair that she needs? And if not, what are the barriers? And then focus in on what are those barriers? What are the limitations in the system? and work with government to ensure that policy flows into practice in a meaningful way. Um, next slide, please. So as we have grown over the years and, and we're now working in seven different countries and exporting um, into other areas as well, one of the fundamental organizational needs has been to build partnerships that ensure our financial sustainability. And to do that, we need to look at building um, not only a market awareness, but market need. But you can never have the market need or awareness in, uh, separated from a shared value and shared trust with your partners. Because in the end, it's the trust in the community that really creates the meaningful change. So we have established multi, um, wheelchair service hubs in other countries with partners, and those service hubs become completely the partner's responsibility, the partner's ownership, and their desire to grow it in whatever way they want. Instead of taking on a corporate model of, for example, like Kentucky Fried Chicken, where we define how everything must work. We rather have chosen to partner in a way where the partners know their work better than we do. And all we have to do is provide tools and partner in a way that adds value to both of us in one layer where we can expand and grow independently in others. I think the, the same sort of relationship has really been important for us with governments because we, we work with multiple governments on government tenders for their health departments, education departments, and social development. 
Um, and there again, we're, we don't see ourselves as just providing a product to government. It's rather how can we help government deliver on their policy in the best possible way and almost work towards becoming indispensable to government in terms of improving their quality of practice and delivery. So the next slide. So we've seen a lot of change in the last 30 years. When I first started and, and my daughter was small, we were told to put her in a home and have another baby. And when we eventually fought to get some equipment for her and keep her, we were sent to the procurement department to get a wheelchair and found it was one for an adult and she was only two years old. So huge change has happened. You can walk through the hills in the country now and find mothers like this pushing their children in appropriate equipment. So we have seen significant change, but what we haven't seen is the change at the scale we need. And what I really believe in the next, I think what COVID has brought us is a new perspective on how to deliver at scale. And over this lockdown, we have turned all our information, all our training online, and through this process, have also established a significant network of parents who are becoming the champions of that knowledge. And I think Uber and the Airbnb and other fundamentally successful web-based organizations have got a huge clue for us in the future of how we're going to take our work forward. And we need to build now, and it's what we're busy with, is designing and building an Uber model of support where the parents and the families and the therapists and the health professionals own the information and create the market desire and need for best possible solutions. And it is not a market top-down driven approach, but rather a needs driven approach fired or fueled by more information to the right people. Information for me should not be held with the professionals or with businesses who benefit from it. Because in that way, when you benefit businesses and health professionals' incomes, you are by definition disempowering the end users from having and holding that information for their own end. So I will leave on that um, contentious point because for us, really shifting the power and the control of knowledge and information and resources is our agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sona, um, for that amazing and fascinating um, talk and really provoking the discussion for us for later on. It's always good to be a little bit controversial because it makes us think, it makes us start a discussion, and that's what we're really here um, for. So thank you for being so personal and sharing your, you know, your personal journey with us. Um, we really value that from you. So thank you again. So moving on to Pratik. Thank you, Pratik, for, for taking the floor now. And we will um, turn to you for you to do your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for the kind words. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evenings, depending on wherever you are. Uh, the big question which I'm asking today is that the world is changing. Uh, why aren't we? Look at the social, economic, political scenarios around us, the way we are looking at education, the way we are treating health, employment, living in general is changing. Digital world, digital technology has made tremendous difference, both positive and otherwise, in our lives, in our everyday lives. We have new fads coming in. So my, we are talking suddenly about mindfulness, yoga is all coming back. So this world around us is changing so fast. But we as assistive technology ecosystem, are we ready to change? And by that, I mean, governments, both central, federal and the state governments, NGOs, civil society organizations, educational institutions, researchers, innovators, and the way we look at 
disability and assistive technology, the way philanthropy work, are we ready to change? Next slide, please. The four pointers which I'm going to talk to you about, uh, according to me, and I've spent 20 years in corporate, like Monica was saying, and, and good 10, 11 years in disability and assistive technology. My worldview is the opportunity we are talking about in assistive technology is unlimited. Obviously, there are challenges which are, uh, you know, where all we don't have one. Uh, I'm going to also share about a little bit about the work which we have done as ATF. And I want to spend the last part of my presentation talking about five future trends. That's just my thinking in terms of how the partnerships in assistive technology uh, you know, are going to change. Next slide, please. So let's start with the good news. Uh, let's talk about opportunity. While traditionally we have seen disability as charity, assistive technology hasn't figured, you know, has figured out in a lot of conversation earlier. Today we are talking about a $26 billion market by 2024 and $31.5 billion market in 2027. So that's how, uh, you know, the opportunity lies in, in front of us. Uh, WHO says that the 2 billion AT devices are going to be required by 2030. And what we have achieved today is just nothing, right? We are only talking about 5 to 10% people who have access to them. By some estimate, uh, they say by 2050, there are going to be 2 billion people aged over 60%. And we unfortunately can't change that. We better be re you know, ready to tackle that challenge. In India, next slide, please. In India alone, we're talking about 70 million people by some estimate uh, who are the people ha having some or the other kind of disability, which really present an opportunity of upwards of $700 million. It's such a large opportunity for any innovator, for any organization who's, who's devising, uh, who's making things, making technology to help people with disability. Let me take another view in the next slide. Uh, take, take an angle of the investors. Uh, by some estimate, there are around 1,700 impact investors, and Im impact investors are interesting people on earth, right? They not only are after the, the profits which traditional venture capitalists are for, but they also care for the impact. Uh, by some estimate, we are talking about $715 billion uh, on offer on card, which we can li all leverage. Unfortunately, in my, you know, my, my reading, we haven't seen a lot of that money coming to the disability market or a stiff tech market, which we, I think, can do more. But what encourages me and, 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 and uh, to share with you, uh, you know, tell you the opportunity lies ahead is there are 1,100 assistive technology companies, startups across the globe, which presents, which are able to uh, you know, uh, realize a funding of around 1.6 to $2 billion. And these are big numbers as we speak. And as we, as we realize, this will only go, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, as an opportunity that it presents, it's only going to increase for all of us. Obviously, there are so many challenges. When we looked at uh, the disability tech market, uh, next slide, please. We looked at important stakeholders and we realized that the whole ecosystem is so fragmented. We spoke to the governments uh, in India and while they had policies, uh, they have large programs, 70% of people in, in, uh, with disability in India live in rural areas. And India is such a, a diverse country in terms of the culture, the community, the geography. Uh, while government had phenomenal policies and the large programs, we realize that their understanding of startups, their understanding of the innovation that's happening in the ecosystem were very, very less. Uh, we looked at the startups, which are the newer age people uh, trying to innovate, changing the world, uh, trying to change the world. While they were very passionate to the cause, they have some, uh, in more cases, they had experiences, you know, personal experiences of they being person with disability disability or their cousin or their friend uh, you know having some kind of impairment so they were passionate they were very technology driven uh, uh, but their access to market was very very poor uh, their introductions to some of the larger pro programs of government was uh, really poor they were doing a lot of pilots and I, and I love saying that we are a country of pilots, not the aviation pilots, but the, you know, you know, people who want to tink around and leave the whole uh, stuff out there. So that innovation wasn't coming out in the market at all, right? It was not really made commercially viable. Uh, you know, some of the universities in India have done phenomenal work, but a lot of that innovation was, in, you know, staying inside it. 
So V2 can attempt to say, how do we take this whole innovation to the market? How do we really have people with disability in India and outside access to this innovation? Uh, next slide, please. So, so many challenges. When you look at from the startup's point of view, uh, while they, they did not really have access to ecosystem experts, there were supply chain challenges. Oh, great. I have, I have I, me and my friend has innovated this phenomenal technology, which is going to help 200 million people across the world. But how I'm going to distribute this whole technology? How I'm going to scale up? Uh, and, and those are the challenges which we saw in the market. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Thinking about all these opportunities and challenges, we realized that we had to do something. We had to really create that ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we did a couple of years back, I got together with a lot of industry people, people from, from corporate, government, and we set up what we call uh, you know, initiative ATF, Assistive Tech Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization based out of Bangalore in India. Uh, we have set up, it's a first innovation ecosystem in India, which partners with multiple stakeholders. Uh, we also run an acceleration program for startups. So we have made a network of 400 plus startups in the country. Uh, we've had 11 startups and we are already looking for an opportunity of really impacting uh, 1 million plus people uh, you know, in the next couple of years. Next slide, please. Uh, I think building partnership is building trust. And these are the six dimensions. In ATF, we look at these six dimensions. Uh, startup by nature, uh, take up one or the other use case to solve problem of disability. Now, how do you really put together all the startups together uh, uh, and collaborate? How do you bring government into play from a policy point of view? How do you bring corporates? I mean, in my corporate roles, I, I, we spend so much money on buying technology. Can, why can't that technology be used for disability use cases? We are partnering with nonprofit, civil society organization, disability experts. We are going and partnering with educational institutions because there's a phenomenal amount of research happening. There are a lot of excited, you know, young professional students who, uh, you know, uh, who are excited about this field. And last but not the least, we are wo closely working with the investor network in India because at the end of the uh, you know, story, uh, you have to invite some investment for, to help some of these organizations grow. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have gathered people from business, disability sector, technology, government, education institution, venture funding, research labs, DNI uh, initiatives, corporates, and and by by seeing this, you can only imagine how colorful my day is, right? I have an opportunity of sitting in Bangalore and talking to anybody and everybody across India and outside. So I I get benefited. Uh, and, and I'm really, really honored to have onboarded so many people who are volunteering to help us build uh, this whole initiative. Next slide. So this next phase of the whole presentation is my thinking on the five trends. What, a few, what is the future of partnership in AT? I'm going to talk about all of them. First is blitz scaling, which is built to partner at scale. Second is co-creation, which is really reimagining the collaboration Third, building an innovation DNA, which is about responsible innovation and the end of distance. It's all about beyond boundaries. And fifth one, which is really my favorite is the power of M. And by M, I mean millennials, young people, entrepreneurs who can do really change the world. Next slide. I read this phenomenal book by founder of LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman, and he talked about blitz scaling, which is really combining the idea of scale, but with speed. Traditionally, we have looked at these two parameters uh, as two different. Blitz scaling is really combining these, the speed and the scale. The question is, in assistive technology, organization are very, you know, structured in a very traditional ways. So it's not about the opportunity, which I talked about earlier. It's about how are you prepared to leverage that partnership? Are you prepared to really, really leverage the opportunity, uh, you know, which is on the card? So to fully leverage the power of connected intelligence, which is only through partnerships, we need to first change and re-architect ourselves. And if we don't, and I'll repeat, if we don't, we are going to leave a lot of value on the table. 
second next slide please the second is about co creation which is reimagining collaboration at organization must change the existing model existing frameworks in order to create something wholly new we are not talking about traditional approaches we are talking about something building something new in assistive technology the frameworks the partnership the technology itself but if we need to grow our impact beyond our circle of influence we really need to think about building sustainable and forward looking partnership and that really is going to be the power of co creation next slide please why not build a organization which has a innovation as a dna so in traditional one and i worked for years in information technology and i realized that there's so much of technology innovation that's happening but today we are talking about responsible innovation we have to talk about inventing a better human centered future of people the future for people with disability and that's going to require a circle of trust that's going to require a, a element of responsible innovation next slide we have traditionally thought about uh, distances from point a and b i think we are today we are talking about global which is combining the global and the local thinking and it that's going to be the future when we distances are not going to matter uh, people and information is 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 information you know is available everywhere and the last next slide is the power of m which is the millennial i talked about there's so many people who are in the field of innovation why not we attract them why not we inspire them to come to disability why do why if we are able to take, uh, inspire 10% of them or or a 15% of them i think we are talking about a different world of assistive technology so while next slide please we in 2020 we are talking about beyond boundaries my assessment my my forecast is that in 2021 and next slide please we are going to talk about human technology we are talk talk we're going to talk about value realization and we are going to talk about amplifying impact uh, you know next slide in the next slide uh, please uh, at atf uh, if you can move to the next slide uh, in the next one of this uh, i again uh, going to ask that question the world is changing uh, Uh, can you please move to the next slide thank you world is changing uh, we are inviting you to partner with us because we are going to be prepared to lead this change thank you so much appreciate the time over to you monica thank you very much pratik i took quite a number of different words away from that a country of pilots i i love that when i mean um, many people will know that in my pro vice provost rail um role i travel to india quite a lot and we've been developing our partnerships with india the iits and many other partners as well around india and it's a shame i can't travel over to see you at the moment but i would love to say thank you for joining us some thank other you. just take home words that i took away um are we ready to change you mentioned the word change many many times and i think that's so true we have to change um otherwise we'll be left behind best one the power of m that's i'm biased to having a name monica the power of monica and maybe i'll use that one in my future talks for myself um but ultimately you talked about beyond boundaries and i think we're talking here about breaking boundaries as well um so thank you prateek we'll come to discuss this further and please do everybody send in your questions so we can have an active discussion as we go through um moving on to my wonderful colleague catherine holloway um somebody who heads up the ucl global disability innovation hub and catherine will discuss how ucl engages with this field so over to you catherine thank you very much Thank you Monica it's a pleasure to be here it's always a pleasure to to have a stage whether it's virtual or otherwise with people like Chapal and and Shona and Wendy and Patik so so thank you very much um I today I'm going to talk about uh, one project that we have at the Global Disability Innovation Hub which is called AT 2030 which stands for Assistive Technology 2030 and some people may already have heard of this um this project Um and so I challenged myself to create a new set of slides. It's a very big program and it's a 40 million pound program. And I wanted to really focus in on the role of partnership in this in this program. So, uh next slide please. Um so here you uh will be seeing uh in a minute any minute now some snapshots from the Global Disability Summit which took place in 2018 in East London and as uh, many of you know East London is or was the home of the most successful most accessible Paralympic games ever 
Um, and it's also the home of the Global Disability Innovation Hub, which is a lasting legacy to the success of the Paralympic Games and a collaboration with, which is led by University College London across many, many partners. And I think as you've heard from Shona and Pratik earlier, that assistive technology success can only happen if we have positive partnerships. Uh, so when this was launched, um, I have to admit that we uh, had just, we got, we got this, it's, it's, there it is, um, Penny Morden, the then um, Secretary of State saying, and the Global Disability Innovation Hub has been given this money for 80, 20, 30 to lead. And the next slide says things like Global Disability Innovation Hub alongside World Health Organization and UNICEF. And I remember sitting there thinking, how, what, what are we going to do? Like, how are we actually going to uh, realise this dream? And the dream really was what um, Theresa May, the then Prime Minister, said, which is it's a reminder to all of us that disability is only a barrier to achievement if society chooses to let it become one. And so that's quite a lot of responsibility um, to take on board. And we, we did it, um, at, if I'm honest, not knowing exactly how we were going to do it, <laughs> but we did it with some amazing partners. And in the next slide, you'll see four snapshots, which are, these are like four little glimpses of my world um, uh, last year, which in the top left-hand corner, you see our students at UCL learning uh, with people with disabilities and some disabled students about the AT2030 project and helping to develop technologies that will be used on the AT2030 project. In the top right, you see AMREF International uh, offices and our, and our team in Africa that are now running the first African um, assistive technology accelerator program. So we have now, we haven't quite got up to Pratik's number of 400, but we have 10 uh, successful assistive technology companies on track to scale um, in Kenya, in Nairobi. And we are working with Bernard, who's at the front there, um, alongside colleagues in London and in across Africa on an assistive technology impact fund. So it's a four million pound fund that will hopefully begin to help unlock the problems of business model. So Pratik talks about all the opportunities. There's loads of opportunities, but the issue is getting uh, new business models that can really scale in this space. And, and when we crack that, and I think, you know, there's a question already about the Airbnb model versus um, more traditional models. And I think there is a way to tilt the playing field of the economy towards inclusion whilst also allowing sustainable growth. And I genuinely believe assistive technology and positive partnerships in this field will be able to show the way in that. In the bottom right, we have Chapal not looking at the camera, but this is taken at the World Health Organization after Chapal's wonderful, one of his wonderful gate meetings. And, and in the bottom left, we have research uh, happening in Sierra Leone with our UCL colleagues in the Development Planning Unit in Bartlett. And so this kind of captures what GDI Hub does, which is research and teaching, innovation, programs being 80, 20, 30, and the advocacy role, which we do with partners um, like GATE. And if we move on to the next slide, I suppose in that, on all of that work, um, you, I had to try and pick a theme that I thought would be useful um, to talk about today in terms of where I think the major shift will be in um, assistive technology partnerships globally. And for me, that is around digital. If we manage to marry well uh, digital and 80, 20, 30, uh, sorry, 80, 20, 30, assistive technology and digital, we will be able to crack, um, I think we'll be able to crack a lot of the inclusion barriers. And a lot of times when people think about disability or, and digital, sometimes there's a natural tendency to think disabled people or persons with disability may not want to use digital technologies. And I hear this when I travel a lot around the world, but that's obviously um, nonsensical. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. And actually, we have shown through our initial research in 802030, for example, in partnership with the GSMA and local partners, we have shown that deaf, the deaf community, for example, are power users of mobile phones. They are a brilliant market opportunity. They're dying to, people are dying to use video conferencing calls. They're, the MNOs, the mobile network operators, are now getting behind inclusive um, uh, kind of price ranges that would help bring in um, people with disabilities onto their mobile phone networks. So mobile phones are working as both, um, uh, we've demonstrated that they work both as a bridge. So when the physical, trying to change the physical accessibility of a city, for example, takes time. Uh, we're working in 80-2030 in GDI Hub um, on inclusive design of the cities, and we had a, a wonderful webinar on that yesterday. But it's not something you can change overnight very easily. 
whereas oftentimes the digital infrastructure can move much more quickly. And we've demonstrated that it acts as this wonderful bridge while we're waiting for the physical world to catch up, the digital can, can come in there and help. But we've also noticed that a lot of times with the way in which we create technology, so they're created often with kind of a Western or a high income mentality, they're not fit for purpose in low income countries. And they're not fit for purpose, not just because the internet's not as good maybe, or but, but mainly because we don't take the community. So Fatigue talked about um, co-development um, and Shona talked about all the partners she brings in to really understand and give ownership to the partners. And I think the, the biggest thing we're realizing is that the sense of community in low and middle income countries is huge. And that community setting, if, if you build technology to enhance that sense of community and, and to, to build on it and from it and into it, you uh, will have much better technologies as well as uh, different business models, as well as more inclusive societies where you don't even notice if, if somebody is uh, disabled. Um, so next slide, please. So the next slide is one of a partnership, one of the partnerships we've done in the digital space on uh, digital manufacturing. And digital manufacturing, I believe that the, the opportunity for new business models in this space is phenomenal. We've looked at, uh, with Motivation Wheelchairs, uh, their new Innovate with a capital AT for the Innovate bit, which is a, a new model. It's not just, people sometimes think this uh, piece of innovation is about 3D printing bits of wheelchair, but it's not. You've got a per parametric model, and that means that you can, you can basically scale the production locally. So you can take measurements in one place and then the, the, you separate out the design process and the manufacture process. So at the core of the innovation is this parametric CAD model, and that could be used in anything. It's being used here for wheelchairs, but it could be used for, for many other forms of assistive technology. So when we're working with, within GDI Hub and within UCL, when we're working with uh, people, what we're trying to help is help bridge the, um, the some of the, technical challenges so for example how do we organize clinical trials for this product how do we then make sure the learnings are usable by the wider assistive technology um, and so in order to try and do that we started uh, next slide please we started building um, uh, enhanced partnerships around local production and local solution and some of this has been motivated by and, and we've been a bit opportunistic in the way in which COVID-19 has come along so COVID-19 has, of course, given us challenges, uh, but it's also given us great opportunity. So the fragility of supply chains has been has been demonstrated and, and the weak points that we all knew were there. Um, and, and so if you've worked in assistive technology, you've known these problems for ages. Um, and yet now we have an opportunity to demonstrate that into more mainstream thinking. And I think that is incredibly powerful. So here, for example, we're building maps at the moment um, of local production and local solutions. Currently, a lot of these companies have pivoted into um, developing sustainable solutions locally for personal protective equipment um, as part of the COVID-19 challenge. But we know that PPE production, for example, is not a sustainable business model. Um, however, assistive technology is. So we are looking at how do we um, help these companies then learn about assistive technology and, and start to develop more assistive technology production sites globally? Uh, so I'll just move on to my penultimate slide, um, which is a, a I'm going to go step forward and then a step back and then I'm going to finish. So a step forward is uh, two new partnerships that we have uh, creating at the moment um, from, from the AT2030 project uh, program. One is with um, the, new, the new UNESCO Center for Artificial Intelligence. And we are looking to do a consensus and scene setting of the challenges where AI could revolutionize an inclusive or an, assist, an inclusive approach or an assistive technology. And that will be published um, by December. And we're just about to enter into a partnership with um, ISPO where we will look at the, the International Society of Prosthetics and Orthotics, and we will look at um, a consensus piece on what is the role of digital manufacturing in prosthetics and orthotics. Traditionally, prosthetics and orthotics are very much a craft. Um, they, they, the way in which they are delivered is, is through a craft-based manufacturing system with a huge amount of clinical input. And we know globally there just isn't the, the um, 
the uh, workforce to be able to get the sufficient number of uh, prosthetics and orthotics to people. And so digital uh, production has an opportunity for us to change that. And we'll be working with you all. So please get in touch if you'd like to be involved in the future of AI or, or prosthetics and orthotics. And if I may, just before I finish, um, I took some snapshots. <laughs> um, I decided to look back and the top right um, picture is a load of people sitting on a couch. And that is actually Victoria Austin, my co-director. That's her parents' old couch. And that is sitting in a UCL building that had just been constructed, had just been like owned by UCL when we kind of just started taking over. We had no furniture, we had nowhere to uh, we had nowhere to be. We were just people with an idea that if we set up this hub, we could maybe do something differently. And there were lots of this type of things, lots of weekends and lots of evenings where we really tried to understand what we could do to help unlock the, the, um, the problems that we have now. And the picture next to that might not look like a lot. It's a wheelchair with some brochures on it and a banner that says, think creatively, work together, drive innovation. But that picture was taken at the launch of UCL East, uh, where we were showing that UCL would have our new campus on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park and that the GDI hub would be this permanent legacy to the, um, the London 2012 Games. And in the bottom are a random selection of pictures that have been taken over the years. And the reason I choose these is because they show friendship and those friendships go through and along a lot of uh, difficult paths. We've had some difficult conversations along the way, but we've also had a lot of um, coffee <laughs> late at night uh, where we've tried to overcome the, the challenges that I think often have to be overcome if you're going to create a positive partnership. And so with that, I'll happily hand over to Chapal to, um, to talk more about the world of assistive technology and positive partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, what amazing talk and for bringing us all up to date with your work. I think some you know, really important elements you've talked about, especially in the current challenging world that we're living in is friendships. I think, you know, we talk about relationship building, friendships, cups of coffee. Um, and again, when I go to India, I have lots of cups of coffee. And that always means that we build really good friendships that actually have taken us through the challenges that we're facing today. And mean, like you've said, that the dreams that we're all talking about can actually come true and I think, you know, if anything that we take away from today and all, all the different talks we've heard so far, innovating, dreaming together, thinking of the future, um, you know, you've been very, very honest about um, your journey. Um, you've not really, you know, you haven't hidden anything, you haven't hidden the reality. And I think that's important for people to know. Um, aspire to what we want to do, try, find the right people to surround ourselves with, and then we can move forward into the next few years together as, as um, friends um, in this journey, hand in hand. So with that, I think we're going to change the gear a little bit and we're going to actually shift towards um, thinking about multilateral institutions um, and Chapel will kindly take us through this next journey. Um, so please do keep sending your questions to us and do keep tweeting as well. Thank you. Chapel, over to you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, my fellow panelists and all the participants in the show. I strongly believe I was born for partnership, developing partnership, nurturing partnership. I strongly believe I alone is zero. The moment I have a person like Shona beside me, I become 10. Among the panelists, Shona knows me the longest because we started our journey and she can be a living testimony of our partnership journey, how we change the wheelchair sector. So, Next slide, please. So I give you an example of some of the work I did and why I believe in partnership. So Monica, maybe you do not know this, that Institute of Child Health was once upon a time a mother of the community-based rehabilitation concept. And I used to work with people like Pam Zenkin, Sheila Witt, Sally Hartley, all these people. And then they actually introduced or promoted CBR Africa network. And I attended the first CBR Africa network Congress in Malawi in 2004. And I said, for my first question to the organizer, where is Africa? 
it is only uganda kenya typical east anglican east uh, african old colony so there is no africa it was named was africa but it was not really africa so what i did immediately next time for the congress we invested money and organized a simultaneous translation in portuguese and french so then we got more people from and then it really became cyber africa network so it opened so people from egypt to angola to mozambique every was niger everybody was in the network and when i was doing the this i was thinking why the other continent do not have a network like this so i was bringing people from latin america or asia to these congresses to get them a test and gradually develop the cbr americas network then cbr asia pacific network and 2012 we created a cbr global network so the journey started in 2004 in few african countries over the eight years it became a global network next so we had a common goal because many times you know to have a partnership you should have a common goal that's the key so we developed together this cbr guidelines with three un organizations 23 ingos 150 global experts we worked together and these guidelines was a bible for the network everybody was following this and this year they were supposed to have a third world congress in uganda but they could not do it because of covid so they will do it next year next please so i moved from cbr a bit and then as sona said besides i was doing in the guidelines on prosthetics orthotics wheelchairs and all and i was realizing why these sectors are not important in the public health so then i was looking it's not the partnership of the organization what is needed is the partnership among the sectors so if you look at this slide the in the global health is the whole population health and if you look the disability is that wide globe and within that disability there is a wheelchair is small dot prosthetic orthotic small dot so if we talk about these small dots to the policy makers in any country they are not interested in africa in many ministries should i talk about 2% disabled people or 50% people dying from possible malaria hiv tb and all this so we are losing the battle in the number game so what i was trying to see that how we can partner all these neglected sectors and make a common cause and become a bigger sector so that global health people understands the, its importance next please next yeah so what i did i brought first thing first i went out of the disability sector because in the moment i was i was feeling that i was stuck in the disability sector and many developing countries whatever you say they do not think there are more than 2% to 5% disabled population exist in the world and they are not low they are majority are poor who cares about them and they are not a priority so i could not expand the areas of the work because they were looking at disability within disability there's a rehabilitation within the rehabilitation there's a wheelchair within the wheelchair there are other mobility so i was getting lost in the number game so what we did we, we took the whole work outside and said that it is as essential as medicines vaccines and diagnostics for the people in need and that's what i repositioned this whole assistive technology sector as a essential health product sector as a essential health technology as a essential health products and then we said that this is as important as medicines 
vaccines and devices. So came out from the little bit disability centric to more public health centric. And fortunately the emerging aging population was reinforcing this concept. So we developed this 5P, I was happy to hear Monica's 4P. So we have this 5P, people-centered, ultimately people-centered. People should be at the center. Users should be at the center. Family members should be at the center. It's not for them. It is by them, of them. And that's what we like to always see. People-centered policy, products, personnel, and provision. This is the total ecosystem. And if you drop one, if you neglect one, other three is going to collapse. So that's how we made this ecosystem. And then, can I have the next, please? And this, as I said, in the 21st century, major drivers of health and social care, not be disability, those traditional disability, is the aging, is the disability, aging, aging related disability, non-communicable disease, especially diabetes and stroke. So what we did, we partnered three key areas, disability, aging, and NCD. So we have a larger market now, larger population. Now the peoples of the po public health, the policymakers listen to us. Hey, these people as a solution, it's not only for disabled, it's also for NCD, it's also for aging, it's also for people with communicable disease. Next. And this opened many new gates. And we try to change the narrative. The whole narrative has to change. And we said that in 21st century healthcare should be beyond boundaries, beyond those traditional concept of preventive, promotive, curative, and rehabilitative. There's a huge need of assistive, assistive care, assistive technology, assistive living. 21st century is all about assistive even despite of COVID. So next, please. So in 4th July, 2015, following the article 32 of the convention on the global cooperation and the strat, uh, partnership SDG goal 17, we brought all the stakeholders together, key stakeholders together and told them 90% population to reach. But at the same time, I said this sector or this market has 90% growth opportunities. So invest in this sector, you will get more return and it's more upcoming emerging sector than the mobile phone. Next, please. So in six years, we have achieved a lot. We organized international conference with people like German Chancellor and Chinese Prime Minister. And Chinese Prime Minister was saying that I have 80 million disabled population in China, 200 million older population, 280 million my domestic market, but I have a 1 billion global market. I want to capture that market. So this kind of a high level statement, political statement, needs to come from many policymakers. So to do that, we pushed this in the 71st World Health Assembly and it got a resolution on assistive technology, which is changing the game quite a lot. Next, please. So we also look at partnership beyond WHO. We understood WHO has its own limited role. WHO alone cannot solve everything. Solve the big issues, we need big partnership. And that's why we created 80 scale, 80, 20, 30, CBR Global Network, and GATO, which is the very latest global alliance for assistive technology. Next. We are again developing a partnership, and now partnership with two sectors, assistive technology and digital technology. So we want to ensure these two sectors collaborate and cooperate and look for total innovation where the people, technology, and environment 
digital as well as assistive work together. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Next one, last. So if anyone want to know more, please log into our GET community and be part of this journey. Thank you. Over to you, Monica. Thank you very much, Chapel. I just want to thank all my speakers. We have Wendy coming up next, but you know, it's it, everybody's so humble. Um, there's so many things that everybody has achieved and facilitated. And Chapel talks about networks and small dots, and you know, we've moved from small dots to um, just creating these unbelievable networks. Um, but raises some important points about the fact that we can't do this alone. However big you are, even if you're the WHO, you cannot do this alone. So we have to come together and we have to develop networks. And we hope going forwards through this conference and through the session, we can start facilitating more networks, strengthening partnerships and working towards a common goal. As we talk about it, everybody needs that common goal to take us forward. Um, the other thing is I like, um, is we were talking about 90% of the population that we have to reach. You know, that's quite a lot, 90%. You know, let's have a high bar of what we want to do. It actually, it should be 100%. But, you know, it's, it's thinking about how do we collectively in the whole world come together and ensure we reach these common goals that we are trying to achieve. Um, and also we talk about um, disability centric to public health. So all the way through a theme is coming, how do we think about things differently? How do we cross sectors? How do we cross disciplines? And how do we bring our own knowledge and expertise together in different ways? So moving on to that, I'd just like to introduce Wendy. Um, Wendy, thank you very much for joining us. And you are our final speaker, but always that means that you will be there to um, and take us forward into the next journey and round up this session of talks. Thank you so much, Wendy, for giving your time. And again, apologies for it being so early um, in America for you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. It's, it's not that early. And I'm just so delighted to have this invitation and to have the opportunity to listen to this amazing panel and uh, hear all these incredible ideas and uh, also be able to contribute. So um, uh, I wanted to give a very quick overview of uh, ADB for those who may not know and understand a little bit about our priority and our thinking on uh, partnerships. And then give a few examples of what we're trying to develop and how within the partnerships. And finally end on a few thoughts on what works and what the challenges are. So next slide, please. Well, very quickly, um, we're a regional multilateral development bank located, our headquarters is in the Philippines and we cover all of Asia and Pacific. Last year, we uh, launched a new uh, corporate strategy called Strategy 2030. And the main uh, focus is on achieving a prosperous, inclusive and sustainable Asia and Pacific. Next slide, please. So within that strategy, there are seven different um, uh, operational priorities. And these are really framed around complex development issues rather than sector specific challenges. So we're really trying to break silos and develop a new way of working and to work together across um, areas and technical specialist areas. But underlying everything is a very strong focus on combining finance, we're a development bank with knowledge and a, a, a view towards uh, future challenges and especially partnerships. Next slide, please. So within, this, uh, within that uh, strategy, um, there's been also quite a big effort to define what we mean by partnerships and what we hope to gain from them. And this is partly due to the realities and constraints in funding, but also an appreciation of the power of partnerships in developing new ideas, expanding capacities, improving knowledge, and especially making an impact on the ground. So I think that you'll note that within this universe of partnerships, we also see universities as playing a very um, important role. Next, please. And uh, this, uh, this slide um, really gives a, a kind of overview about uh, how we're trying to think about partnerships in, in action and how they really fit within our entire business cycle and, um, and, and ecosystem of what we're doing. Everything from technical support to capacity building to research, innovation and pilots, um, policy dialogue. This is critically important um, because our clients are governments and also we have a private sector arm, but this policy dialogue is really where I wanna focus because uh, the big challenge is um, going from policy to practice on the ground. And that's where I think that these partnerships are most important. And we're also thinking about partnerships going across global level, regional and local level and the importance of that. 
So next slide, please. So just quickly to situate a little bit about what's happening in Asia and Pacific, we have a range of uh, key trends and challenges, many of which have been touched on by Chapal and others here, and especially uh, a very strong impact now from COVID-19. So I agree with uh, Shona and everybody else that this is a really big opportunity, but how we, how we, how we uh, go about building back better is really important, and this is a very critical time. Um, just to highlight a few of them, obviously, uh, remaining poverty and inequality, regardless of the just enormous uh, progress over the last couple of decades in Asia and Pacific is still, is still a very big issue. And the impact from COVID is going to be very critical and really push uh, back a number of years and take a long time for individuals and households to be able to recuperate businesses and, and otherwise. Second, to, to talk to Chapal's point, um, this region is both um, has the largest number of young people, but it is also the fastest aging. And this demographic transition is happening very quickly. Some countries, it's extremely rapid. Uh, China, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, very fast. Other countries, not as fast, but they will end up with very large uh, older populations quickly, like Indonesia, for example. And then other countries, not as fast, but um, what's important is to be prepared for this transition and the types of ideas and approaches that they are um, undertaking can make a very big difference for how everybody else thinks about opportunities going forward. And, uh, um, and within that, Chapal also outlined the issue about uh, um, disability, the overlap between these issues and the need to um, address quite comprehensively. Next slide, please. So to drill down a little bit on these uh, key issues, um, disability and aging, this is really where a big core of the leave no one behind agenda is, uh, is, is focused now. And um, this is uh, all the more reason about why we need to really focus here. So these are major social and development challenges for Asia and Pacific going forward in the next 10 years, and especially in the next 15. And as Chapel said, um, about 70% of the population of people with disabilities actually live within the Asia and Pacific region. And from 2015 to 2050, that global population is expected to go from just under 2 billion to over two, uh, just under 1 billion to over, to just over 2 billion, that global population of uh, people 60 plus. But 65% of that change will actually happen in Asia and Pacific. So these are critical issues for us. And the next 15 years is really the important time for adapting and adapting across all systems uh, from infrastructure to human resources, to models of uh, health and social care, to, um, I mean, transport to just anything that you can imagine is really uh, related to this. And that's why it's so important across all of the operational priorities we have. And in our strategy, we've really tried to put a very strong emphasis on the role that everybody has to play. Um, also, there's an enormous amount of policy development happening extremely quickly. A lot of this is being led by big global players, the UN and, and others, but strategic planning and very clear ideas on how best to adapt are really lagging and making that difference between big, uh, big ideas going forward and really putting it on the ground is where, um, is, is where a big part of the challenge lies. And uh, as everybody has said, the demand for AT is gaining momentum as a key issue as well that cuts across many of these areas, including smart city development and, and uh, human resources and otherwise. Next slide, please. So just a couple of quick uh, illustrations about what we're trying to do um, and uh, the way in which we're trying to uh, develop new partnerships that can help us to really address that kind of middle challenge. So if I look at the case of Mongolia, which is an amazing country um, where uh, uh, Chapal also has enormous experience, they have a, um, a very strong policy development um, and over a long period of time on paper um, and, and somewhat in practice, um, there has really been a very strong commitment from, uh, um, from that uh, government and country over a long period of time. In fact, last year, they were the ones who hosted that uh, network uh, major um, regional uh, uh, conference. And in 2016, they passed the law on disability but now the challenge is really to be able to put this into practice on the ground and to move from that. So um, at the same time, uh, we have been developing a number of projects. We have our first fully focused um, disability inclusion project. 
um, which is a really a kind of an interesting um, outlier among the among the MDBs, or an interesting example among the MDBs. Um, we also have uh, one of our key areas of investment is in uh, urban development, and we've been doing a lot on on master planning and inclusive uh, development. And we have a number of uh, new projects on affordable housing and uh, gear area development or informal um, informal housing development, uh, informal community development, and then. Um, of, uh, new projects on inclusive education and also on inclusive urban transport. There are other players um, also focusing on these issues um, like JICA, like WHO in Mongolia, and of course a very strong participation by NGOs and DPO initiatives um, there. But uh, I actually went to the Global Disability Summit in London a couple of years ago, and it was there that I heard about uh, GDIH, and I think it was around the time that they were beginning to really get off the ground. And I thought it was one of the most interesting and exciting things that I had heard about. So we've been pursuing um, getting to know each other and now have developed a kind of uh, partnership, which I think is going to be uh, very, very fruitful going forward. And uh, um, it's a little bit like going down the river holding the rocks, but I believe that river is going to be really interesting and lead to the sea. So that's, that's you know, also have uh, big hopes going forward. But that partnership is going to focus on um, their core strengths in assistive technology. That disability project is really uh, helping the government to um, elaborate the policy on assistive technology, where they buy it, how they buy it, how it's distributed, whether or not local production uh, can be considered, and also inclusive design. And that is an issue that goes across all of our areas and um, and also government's interests. And as uh, I, I think uh, uh, Kathy may have been uh, referring to the case study that was just recently done um, by her team um, in Mongolia that we were also trying to share um, our experience with. So I think that is going to be something uh, really exciting and look forward to working with, with everybody on building a really good example of what can happen looking at the case of Mongolia. The uh, next uh, slide is about um, um, one of the ways in which we are uh, trying to um, really uh, help to prepare countries for this uh, demographic transition. Um, about seven years ago, we started receiving in our um, China portfolio, a lot of demand for projects on elderly care. And um, that it was a brand new sector in China where a lot of the policy development is happening, going across the roles of government, private sector, civil society, and the public. And in doing that work, we learned an enormous amount and also understood where the huge knowledge gaps were. So in an effort to try to quickly develop knowledge across the region, we put together this technical assistance we've been running for the last three years, which has really been working in six countries on uh, in-depth country diagnostics um, and gap analysis on the evidence base that policy, institutional financing programs, human resources, um, and the situation really of uh, older persons. Then a strong program in capacity building, an effort at uh, strategic planning, looking at what can be critical investments and areas for focus for the next five to 10 years. And now um, 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 a series of pilots in four countries that are really trying to develop um, one of the key ideas that has been coming out all over the world is global good practice of community-based care models. And these are, um, you know, have to be affordable, accessible, efficacious, and um, and and also bring in um, new services development and access to assistive technology. So that's all leading to an emerging pipeline development. But we have not done this by ourselves. We have really been focusing on the um, in the importance of partnerships and developing um, new modalities like um, center of excellence partnerships, knowledge partnerships and others to be able to support this and to um, really crowdsource all of the best ideas and especially experience on the ground to be able to uh, move this work forward. Next slide, please. So in short, like everybody, and uh, we didn't see each other's slides, we're really trying to create an ecosystem of partnerships. Um, we have a great one with uh, what, uh, what we've designated as a center of excellence on, uh, excellence on community care models in Singapore South Foundation. And they have been bringing a lot of experience in terms of capacity building, piloting and evaluation. I've just described about the one with GDIH. We've also been developing a kind of university uh, network um, 
focusing on developing the evidence base for policymakers and with policymakers. And I think that this uh, kind of partnership is really very important because it's compressing that research um, uh, approach that is the normal um, approach within a university and developing new methods and tools to really focus and, and discussion to really focus on what are some of the critical issues for policymakers and developing the evidence base around that for better decision making. And finally, also reaching out to um, try to um, engage with advocacy groups and to really create win-win situation, situations. So one of them is with this uh, GLAD, the Global um, Network on, uh, on, on Action on Disability. And with them, we've partnered to, um, we do a lot of work in social protection. And uh, last year we had a huge um, conference that we have every two years where um, we worked together and they brought in 22 different DPO organizations to be able to first learn more from policymakers and the discussion on social protection to be able to advocate better going forward. And this is really opening up the discussion and the kinds of uh, partnerships that we see working together. So finally, in conclusion, I think uh, Monica and the organizers asked uh, my next slide, please, what works and what challenges do you face? And I think that um, for, for me uh, and, and the experience that we're having, it's obviously that um, partnerships have a life cycle. They need um, some very good nourishment in the beginning, and, um, but they also need to be nourished and managed the whole way through. Champions are extremely important. Uh, partnerships don't need to last forever. Um, they can really uh, spark and form around um, specific issues or they can also um, try to go for the longer term. As everybody said, they really require a lot of trust and taking time to develop, especially when you're trying to move in areas where you're not sure what the, what the final outcome will be. Uh, identifying these potential partners and looking for innovators is a lot of work and um, you really have to go out and, uh, and, and search. But getting on the same page, aligning priorities, assessing capacity and clarifying the roles are the very essential steps and doing that in a super clear headed way that also really looks for all the win-wins and synergies and how to push, um, how to push further than just doing the immediate. Um, flexibility and focus are key. And these are sometimes very difficult uh, things to find in, in uh, partners, especially when you're going across areas where you don't and industries where you don't normally really work uh, together. Um, there's a important role for effective partnership management and then also networking these partnerships to really develop that ecosystem. I think that um, uh, this is, uh, um, you know, bu building that engine to drive things forward depends on more than just one or two. It's really about uh, crowdsourcing them together. So thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. What an amazing talk. I mean, it's really taken us another step down the journey. You mentioned policymakers and how we need to have that policy dialogue, another P, of course, for me, um, but policy to practice, um, an essential ingredient. You also talked about big opportunities, and it's a critical time when we have big opportunities, and we need to be actually coming together and collectively engaging in those opportunities. And you talked about being prepared. I thought that was very interesting. You know, we really need to be prepared, another P for me. I, I think people start laughing me about my P's at the end of this. Um, but you talked about clear ideas of having clear ideas. And I thought that's, that's really so important. What is the idea? How clear is it? How can we take it forward to the next stage? You also mentioned elderly care. Um, and of course, I'm biased towards pediatrics and children. Um, but, you know, yes, elderly care is an extremely important area that we mustn't forget. And um, we really have a duty of care to think about the impact on our elders in our society. Um, and finally, you know, you just, all of the presentations actually have just been so inspiring, bringing out very different parts of the journey across this translational pathway. But what we really want to do now is we have our um, great speakers with us, our experts with, the, with us, but it's over really to you as the audience. It's your time to really engage with our speakers and ask them the questions that you want to. So to, to start this um, process and take them into this next journey of this session, um, we thought we'd start by um, having an audience poll. It's always a good way to get people thinking. So you'll see that there will be um, a question that will be coming your way. You'll be able to see it on your screen. Hopefully you can all see it there. I'm sure you can. And the question is, what are the key challenges that you have come across when building partnerships? 
If you could all type your answers, we'd be very, very grateful for you because we really want to um, draw out some of the words and, and the themes that you actually tell us about. This is your time to share with us. It's both bi it's a bilateral um, discussion, this is. And then we'll have a look at the results and see what's coming up and, and feed back to you later. And again, remember, please do keep tweeting. I have to keep saying this in, in the social media age. Um, but as we go forward now, I have lots of questions I could ask uh, the panel, but I'm actually going to restrain myself because I think it's only fair um, to engage you in, in the audience. Um, so I'm going to hand over to my wonderful moderator, Amit, who's one of our partnership managers. And Amit's going to take over from me, me now. He's been looking at all the questions that have been coming through, and we'll propose some of these to our different um, expert panelists, um, and then we'll take it forward from there. So Amit, over to you. We can see some great words coming up there. I hope you can, you may or may not be able to see those, but the wonderful, you know, building cultural, um, culture, sharing, ownership ideas, lack of communication, sharing the same vision. Please keep uh, bad coffee. I love that one. You know, what, what, what's bad coffee? We've all had that, but actually coffee is coffee. Sometimes you just need the coffee. Um, so we have to keep going with whatever we can get silos. Um, working in silos is a huge, huge problem. Um, we don't want to be working in silos. We want to break those, break those boundaries. Um, sustainability, language barriers. We still have that. We still have some that are a little bit bigger than others, don't, aren't they? Like-mindedness, market size, internal setbacks. Some very interesting things actually coming through at the moment. So while we're um, just um, looking through some of the questions that are coming our way, maybe I could ask um, the panelists a question. So what is the one, just the one, I'm gonna keep you all very, very short. What is the one key advice you would give to help create a toolkit on partnerships? And, and maybe we'll go um, to um, Shona first on that one. What's the one key advice? Sometimes you can't choose to partner with somebody who has shared values. But um, I would say for us, the most important thing is looking at shared values and, and trust. When you have to build a partnership with somebody, for example, that you don't necessarily share values with, like a government um, or um, a big corporate, then it's, a, it's about really ensuring that the outcomes are clear for both of you, that you share at least an agreement around what you want to see happen at the end of the partnership. That's great, thank you, thank you. Um, we'll come back to the rest of the audience, we'll, we are, we're rest of the panelists, we'll let you think about this. Um, and we have some questions coming through and we, we had some um, that we were just looking at to see which ones were the top ones for you. Um, so that we could prioritise them. Um, but we'll, we'll come to many or of the others at some point as well. So Amit, would you like to take over from here? Sure, thank you very much, Monica. Hopefully you can all hear me. So we've had a range of questions uh, from partnerships down to innovation, down to the voice of the disabled, to manufacturing. Let me start with the partnership question. This is to all members of the panel. Um, you know, how can positive partnerships address the power of politics such that we actually build an equal and impactful relationship um, you know, around the world. So Wendy, can I um, offer you the platform in terms of that positivity that's required vis-a-vis -vis the politics of power? Yeah, thanks, thanks Amit for throwing me in the deep end. But um, yeah, I think it's an incredibly important uh, uh, question. And I guess that um, the, you know, the, 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 the part of the answer that immediately comes to mind is um, the need to be very aware about that and the need to uh, really try to develop that range of partnerships which brings um, all those uh, different voices together on an equal playing field. And I think, um, you know, everybody has a, has a different role uh, for that, but partly it's being ready and willing to play um, to play your uh, to, to play those roles and and really have that uh, discussion and and well to be 
for everyone to be as cognizant as, as, as possible about that as a very important uh, issue and to develop as level a playing field as possible with the rights, with, with the range of stakeholders coming in to be able to address that up front. Sure. Th th thank you very much, uh, Wendy. It, it's clearly a very complex area. Um, if I can just turn now to Chapel. Chapel, one of the issues uh, that colleagues have raised, and this is in terms of policy interventions, um, given your experience, you know, what would you say are the key policy interventions that governments perhaps around the world should be making in terms of uh, assistive living, assistive technology and supporting disability uh, uh, you know, around the planet? I think today's world, people wants to see that all the policymakers really wants to see the return against investment. That's the hard fact. So what you need to do, you have to need to change your narratives and make a case, a win-win case for the government. Why should government invest? And by investing what government gains. So we have to come out from that kind of a traditional mentality of doing something good for some vulnerable population. I say it is a no. You are creating a wealth, you are creating a new job market, you are opening your GDP, export opportunities. It will create new jobs for so many millions. And that's what government wants to know. That's where government is, wants to see that this is a, not a dead end sector. You know, it's not a one way traffic. By investing, there is a more benefit. And that's the kind of a narrative. Once you can sell it, it really there are some buyers. That's what my experience is. It's, a, it's everybody, it applies to everybody. You know, nobody does anything if it doesn't benefit them or the near few near population, right? So don't think everybody is saying. So we have to really see that we have an idea which benefits everybody. And if we can sell that, then it is good. The problem is that we, the biggest problem is with us. Whenever we do this partnership and all, we cannot come out from that I and we phenomena. We have to really embrace we and our. And the moment we do that, I come out, I broke, break all the shackles around me. So make, make a case instead of I to we, the world changes. So problem is with me, not problem with anybody else. That's how I start. Chapel, thank you very much. I mean, the powerful word is we. It's about us together as a community. Um, you know, as well as, of course, what's in it for individuals and society, of course. Thank you for that. Pratik, if I could move to you now. Um, uh, this is a two-part question to you. Uh, the first part is very much um, around your model, your partnership model. How can that apply to universities? And linked to that uh, and extending it, what is the role of frugal innovation, very much active in India, in terms of hel helping assistive technology? Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, I'll answer first uh, question in terms of university. See, it's a, when we look at all the university partnership at ATF, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, multifaceted. One, we have a lot of technology institutes who are doing innovative solutions, right? There are uh, labs uh, of assistive technology uh, in those universities. So there's a lot of innovation products are being built. Our partnerships and dialogue with the universities about while you are good at innovation, putting resources, phenomenal research work, how can we help you take that technology out in the market? Because we have access to the market, but you may or may not be the best people to market, uh, to, to, to do the branding, to do uh, the outreach, to do the distribution. And we have those large partnerships at ATF to help you do that, right? So they play a very critical role in the innovation side. There are so many young minds working on, 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 on those innovations and we want to leverage all that value and take it out to the market and make this AT available in the hands of people with disability. So that's one. 
India is all about frugal innovation. You, if you can put your minds together, uh, you make a phenomenal product. You have figured out the marketing, branding, distribution, all that. But if people in the ground cannot buy, uh, it's it's not going to work. So inherently, in uh, in my experience at ATF and in general, I've seen it's all about bottoms up innovation. And I think uh, a lot of this innovation can be shared with the rest of the world. Because what inherently we are, you know, innovating is a device or a technology which works. Obviously, it can be customized to the different contexts, but it inherently is so uh, frugal, it's so economically uh, possible, uh, you know, for a person on the ground to buy, right? It's, a, it play, it's going to play a huge role. And I'm very excited that some of the solutions at ATF and the startups are global solutions. Thank you, Prathik. So that's so important, um, particularly how you've how you've progressed the journey in terms of university to uh, to reality on the ground and helping communities um, and the role of frugal innovation in India, community led, community driven, um, really, I guess, by families, mothers, uh, parents, uh, especially when there's a need. Let me move over to Kathy now. Kathy, we've heard about frugal innovation. Um, we've heard about all the exciting work that your project is doing and the impact it will absolutely have around the world. Um, but the question now is on manufacturing. How do you link in or how do you integrate low tech and high tech um, activities to really maximize uh, the production, let's say, of prosthetics, you know, in the marketplace, um, you know, at a price that is affordable? both by governments, but also by individuals as well. So how is that transition working, or that translation working, um, you know, in your mind? Um, well, so I suppose if we, if we take the uh, very exact example of prosthetics, um, if you want to digitalize some of the process, uh, you need to scan normally the stump. So if you're missing a part of your limb, you have a stump that's, that, that's left, um, and that needs to be scanned. And until recently, the scanners were very expensive or they, did, they weren't good enough. So from a high tech point of view, the technology is getting better. So um, equally, if you looked at the world of AI, there's like a triple ex exponential going on with AI. The, tech, you know, the hardware is getting better. The math is getting better. The data is getting better. There's, you know, so we've got this, this high tech um, revolution. So going back to prosthetics and manufacturing, I think that um, we have better scanners. We're getting better, for example, uh, 3D printing. Um, we're getting better processing power, even on your mobile phone. I mean, this mobile phone that I've got here is, is probably more powerful than my first laptop ever was. Um, and so people can process things remotely. So the high tech is there. Um, and, and when it comes to the, the low tech, I, I think sometimes the low tech is, is, is a poorly named, if you like. So it just means it maybe costs a bit less money, but actually getting it right is, is a, a higher challenge. So the low tech is, a, is, I think, about how we connect all of this in, in some way in, into, into society, which doesn't seem very low to me. It seems quite a, a big challenge, but you can distribute. So you can separate where the design work happens. You can separate where the production happens and you can and you can and everything is now connected. So um, I think there's huge opportunity there. There's, this also brings in the opportunity for repair. So one of the big problems with things like prosthetics or wheelchairs is that they break. And then people are, you know, we've heard time and time again in, in Asia or, or in Africa that people are miles away, hundreds of miles sometimes away from where they could get this fixed. Um, and so if we build these kind of uh, mass, um, like mass, the ability to mass produce, but, um, but locally, um, and the high tech helps do that. But if we manage to do that, then we can build local resilience into the supply chains and into the user experience. And when we've done that, for example, the motivation work, whether it's in wheelchairs, not prosthetics, but when we've done that and we've tested it, we see uh, a kind of multiple effects. So the multiplier effect here is um, the people, the users of the assistive technology feel like it's their technology more because it was locally made of local materials and, and they know how to fix it. They, they feel more empowered by it than if it's just shipped in from somewhere and given to them. And secondly, the, 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 the practitioners feel more confident because they know they can repair it. So they, they don't feel like they're going to raise hope and then that be taken away. So I think it's a great question. And I think the, the, literally we're just turning a corner for this to, to take hold. And, and we've been very lucky to partner with um, COVID Action to start looking at some of the work that they're doing globally. It's another partnership that's just arisen. Um, and that's where the whole innovation action partnership across UCL's Faculty of Engineering has come along. And, 
And like Pratik says, that's hopefully opening up universities for us to give out what we're really good at, which is expert knowledge, but partnering with people who can then take that to market that may be a better at that side of the things than, than we are. Thank you, Cathy. That was a very, very comprehensive answer. And, and clearly it's a, it's a very important journey, um, you know, in, in terms of lab to lab stroke bench, to factory to market to community. It's, it's rather like my, my farm to fork journey that I have every weekend. I'm over here in London. Um, thank you for that. Shona, let me now turn to you. Uh, a question pertinent to Africa, especially where you're based. And I know this is a passionate question for you. Um, what do you think governments in Africa need to do to really embrace and inculcate support for uh, assistive technology and the community that really needs it? Um, and you know, how, how does that translation really work as, as you see it? I think governments really need to realize that the only way they can address these issues is through public-private partnerships. Um, they also need to start supporting, I mean, there's constant crying about um, job creation and, and a need for inclusive job creation, but the borders are still very much open to imports. And so I think, again, we, we need to look at how, how do we encourage governments to support local manufacture, to actually invest in it, to start building internal strengths and resilience in their own markets. Because as, as to what Kathy was saying, when you have local product, you have lo local support, you have ability to, to constantly meet the need in a way that is really appropriate for that region and that country. So if we are looking, and, and we work very closely with a number of governments, and not just governments of health, it's, it's departments of science and technology and departments of social development. But the strength, I believe, for them lies in the trusting public-private partnerships and not trying to do it all themselves. And you will often find government departments now, um, I, I know with us, we have a department of um, industry, technology and industry, that is trying to, to actually start businesses themselves, almost in competition with local industry. And it's just a ridiculous way to go because they don't hold... Mm the entrepreneurial skills. Um, so I think if, if we're gonna move in any direction, it, it's really about companies approaching government in a way that talks in their language to a way forward in terms of building capacity inside and ensuring its sustainability for the people because that's how we connect with, with the ground. Thank you, Shona. That's such an important statement, both in terms of the role of PPP and I think the trust. And that actually just leads me on to another question, if I might ask you. Um, and this is, um, you know, a point that, a, that, that, a, that one of our audiences made. Real innovation actually lies within disabled people themselves. And this issue about trust, you know, how can we build it with them and actually learn from them to achieve that collective solution. And I think you're well placed given what you've done in South Africa. Um, yeah, I suppose that talks a bit to the, the question of my comment on Uber and, and BM, Airbnb. Mm. Um, for so many years, I think NGOs and, and, and social enterprise, in fact, even government, look at working with working with one person to, to many people. So you upskill a, a therapist, you upskill a teacher, and you expect them to pass knowledge on to many people. And then in the last few years, we started looking at more and more activities that were around trainers of trainers, the many-to-many -many model of, of where we are um, trying to scale, but we all come to the realization that even many-to-many -many just doesn't work. There aren't enough people 
to be able to do that. And the cost is too high in organizations to employ more and more people, to train many, many more people. And so that brings me to the, the challenge on the ground. When we, we started realizing during COVID, it became so clear that here were parents who were not allowed to access hospital unless critically ill, were not able to take their children to school and didn't hold any of the knowledge or skills themselves to be able to make informed decisions around their child's education or their child's health. So they were pretty much stuck and isolated. And because of stigma and bias, didn't even have community support. So it was during this time that we, we started realizing that what is really needed is an expansive shift and reframe of how to how to transfer information to parents. And we escalated a, a two-year plan to create a parent network where we have parents who support other parents and those parents then identify parents in the community. And through our using just simple WhatsApp technology and Duo, we're able to transfer huge amounts of information to the network parents who in turn transfer information and get information back from the parent champions who are the people on the ground identifying new parents in the community. And this then really becomes the Uber model where it's anybody to anybody in a transfer of information. And, and that's what I was meaning in, the, in terms of using the Uber model. We need to think differently. We need to give up control and we need to trust the systems with enough information to pass on as long as we can keep getting feedback and also yeah. feed down into the communities. And through that process of collecting information up through the communications with parents, we can then package that information in a really useful way and feed it back down into the communities where the data came from. And in that way, we, we are growing I mean, just in a few months, hundreds of parents on the ground, hundreds of network um, connections and multiple partnerships are starting to grow. And I really see that as taking the best out of um, a business model and just repackaging it into a social, social agenda where nobody gets rich except a richness of information gets shared. Thank you, Shona. Um, that, that's su such a powerful message in terms of the use of data to drive both bottom-up and top-down activity as well. L let me turn to Prathik and Kathy now. Um, the same question to both of you. So let's start with Prathik. Prathik, it's a question on methodology. Um, you know, how do we ensure that there is a proper, flexible methodology that allows good innovations happening in various startup companies, not just in India, but around the world, to actually feed into the community and connect to the last mile? Is it a question of financing or does marketing have a role to play uh, in this particular regard? Sure, thank you, Amit. So if you see the ecosystem of startups, not in a step technology, but in general, the ecosystem of startup, it has come up so well. Uh, there is a joke in India and particularly in Bangalore that if you throw a stone, you won't, it, it would land up uh, somewhere in startup hub, right? So that's, that's how prevalent the whole approach. The, there are so many of startups, uh, you know, who have come up in last 10 to 12 years in India. Now look, startups, like I was saying earlier, take up a particular use case or a problem to solve or to innovate. Yes. Uh, you require, and, and by definition, startup will have limited resources. So all you need is that whole ecosystem around the startups to help them grow. Yeah. And, and different startup at different stages have different needs uh, around them. Right. So if you're an early, uh, uh, you know, at an early stage, probably you need help in connecting with a civil society or an NGO to test your products. Probably you need a disability expert to give you guidance on the on the features of your uh, you know of, of your product. Mm -hmm. As you grow and uh, in your journey, you need investments to uh, uh, to to invest in hiring the technology folks. You you need to invest in office space and things like that. 
more, more you take uh, you know forward steps you need uh, partnerships of distribution and manufacturing at a large scale and all this is possible if uh, as governments or as innovation uh, uh, you know, ecosystem enablers like ATF, we create that ecosystem. A startup is never, never going to generate so many resources on its own. So what mm-hmm. you need is framework. What you need is a, is, a, is, a, is a partnership ecosystem around all these startups. And I, I believe once you have done a good job in giving them resources, uh, some of them, we are already seeing that change happening, uh, are going to build uh, for for, for uh, build a global solution, right? So they are not obviously they need to be customized to the community and the and the geography in terms of language and all that. But there's one startup ID in in our cohort in ATR, and it is uh, their solution for a person with visual impairment is now being used in 160 countries, and this is five people sitting in Bangalore. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, so the same question to you. I mean, what do you see as that translational journey in terms of an ecosystem of startups feeding, being supported by 802030 potentially, and you know, feeding into the community to develop solutions and generate solutions into the market? Thank you, Amit. Um, I, I mean, we, we're trying to, to develop the ecosystem uh, in such a way that it would be sustainable beyond the lifetime of the 802030 grant. And we are doing that by limiting our geographical focus to, to East Africa, to Kenya, and, and also um, working a little bit, actually, with partners at the ICMR and others in India. Um, and, and we've kind of targeted a little bit, uh, like Patik says, we've targeted a uh, user-centered design, business model testing, um, but baked that into the core inclusive design or the inclusive innovation curriculum that we've developed, as well as the inclusive uh, innovation toolkit. And both of those will be becoming open source materials once they're fully tested um, in the next cohort of the accelerator, so before the end of the year. Um, and that one of the reasons for making all of these things open source is that we want to share globally uh, and we want to, to learn globally. So. Um, the second thing, though, is investment, and and I think this is where we can we can all still do a better job. So, um, like Pratik, we've developed live labs for for testing with users um, in Kenya. We we get a lot of uh, we've got a lot of uh, demonstrable evidence that the products are good fit to users, and that there's even a good business model as a market fit. But then, oftentimes, the purchasers are either government um, or they are large large organisations, and I think that helping the startup get to the point of being able to pitch into those kind of organizations is very difficult and and it takes a lot of time but it also needs a bit of learning the other way Uh, governments and and large organizations really need to educate themselves and and get involved a little bit in in the startup area Um, and i i honestly believe universities can can play a role here um, in helping to bridge some of those divides Uh, we have a lot of resources that are actually able to help people learn to pitch and uh, and we also hold a lot of strategic relationships that we don't sometimes utilize at that startup level and I think that that's that's something I I really feel strongly about within GDI um, Hub and and, you know one of the reasons we've we've got on well with people like Chapal and and Wendy is that we've gone to look and see where can these strategic uh, relationships be best built so that they can connect people who don't normally get connected uh, and, and, and that we are not some kind of gatekeeper to that that thing we are we are the person opening the door and helping people find the door by themselves um, and, and I think that's that's for me the the next stage the next big um, thing I would like to crack if I can. Thank you thank you that's, that's very good so certainly the word human-centric design I think relationships are absolutely key as, as you describe them um, and of course that inclusivity so let me now turn my final question, and I've got two minutes for this particular question, to you, Chapel, and to you, Wendy. And this is really about the voice of the disabled. Um, as representatives of uh, the Asian Development Bank and indeed the World Health Organization, how, as you build up your policy, your practice, your delivery, do you inculcate the voice of the disabled in terms of some of the decision-making processes that you have to undertake both internally and externally? to uh, governments uh, in your jurisdiction and indeed around the world. Wendy, if I could ask you to answer that question first. Hi, thank you. Well, I think we're trying to do that in in many different ways. I mean, first in in terms of the project uh, preparation and design um, 
work that we do, we have a mandated, very strong consultation process and, um, and uh, um, disabled persons are, are a big part of that, particularly in the types of projects that we're looking at um, that, I was, that I was showing you in, uh, in Mongolia, but also across the board. And right now we're creating a kind of strategic roadmap um, for our institution going forward on how to really strengthen our approach on uh, disability inclusion and that kind of participation is a big, is a big part of it. The second is um, obviously through that whole uh, discussion that we have um, with government, really ensuring that kind of multi-stakeholder uh, engagement in the in in the entire process of the development. These are big projects, you know. These are uh, millions and millions of dollars, and their voices are so important from the <clears throat> beginning to the end. Um, and also uh, for kind of uh, feedback through the whole implementation process. So building that in, and. Uh, um, and then uh, finally, as a part of that strategic roadmap, also developing for ourselves a kind of uh, reference group, both international and uh, local level uh, DPOs to be able to help us to orient well and, and get some constant feedback. So all of that is something that's <clears throat> gonna be out in the next few months and I think will really help us to, to uh, respond much better. And just, um, and, and just also following on uh, something that Kathy was saying, I mean, I think that one of the most important spaces that's neglected in partnership development is really at the incubation stage and this getting to know and anything that we can think about about how to, um, how to strengthen that part of the process is really important. So things that I see happening in, in uh, the region where I'm working that I think are helping to strengthen that is, um, you know, uh, setting up these uh, kind of incubation centers at, at, at universities, which are bringing together um, government and uh, private sector and innovators uh, and persons with disabilities and older people to co-create and, and create what this next generation of innovation is gonna be about. And then bringing uh, partners like ourselves to the table in terms of helping to think to, to we have a ventures uh, group which invests in startup. We have a private sector group which invests in larger uh, private sector. And we, we work with our government partners to understand that space better and think about what can be the solutions for the future. That's where we need to focus and, uh, and try to really, um, you know, nurture that part of the process. Thank you very much, Wendy. Chapel, if I could just bring you in for a very quick response in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, the voice of the disabled, how do you engage through your activities at the WHO? We do not do anything without engaging disabled people or older people in our discussion. Kathy, Shona, who knows our work more. We have an expert advisory group for our global report. We have a 25% of the experts are personal experience of disability or older people. We even in WHO, we get so much support because one of our big bosses has disability. They don't say it, but we know. So, you know, we don't do anything anything without active engagement. In the global report, we will capture the voices of 100 users. And 100 users will be disabilities. And also disability is not a single group. You yes. keep it in mind. Even with, there is a hierarchy within disability. Yes. Is the blind and wheelchair users, they monopolize the disability world, OK? So. Mm -hmm. We try, when we say that disability, we say really cross disability. We give an equal distribution that among all groups. So we are in this business for the last 40 years. So we know yes. what is this and what's the politics, what's the dynamics. So we can tell you, we can assure you that whatever we do on the assistive technology, users play a central role. And without them, we do not take one step forward. So in, we are just putting a new call where we are creating a demand generation and we are encouraging International Disability Alliance, Help Page, this kind of organization because they should 
create the demand. Yes. They are the main ambassadors to raise this. And we need to give them the support to do it from the behind. And that's how we want to change the world. Great. So, Chapel, thank you very much for that. And I hope that reassures the audience and our, and our delegates who've joined us of, of uh, how the WHO approaches such a complex issue. Um, let me transfer back to Professor Monica Lachenpaul as chair now for her comments. Monica, over to you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, all our panelists. Um, you know, coming together in this global world is so important. Um, we're coming to the end of the session now. And um, we're going to really take ourselves forward over the next 10 minutes as we close the session with one first audience poll. Um, and as that poll runs, we I can then sum up for you some of the um, areas we've been discussing today. So if you could all look on your screens, the poll says, the question is up there, how do you think higher education could take a more active role in developing partnerships? And this is really important for us as a higher education representatives to understand this from you. So we really do hope that you will um, contribute your answers to this question. Every answer to every poll is so important for us as we take our journey important. So please do engage with it. It's wonderful. And all your questions as well. We are collating all your questions. Um, if there are questions that we haven't been able to answer, but we know who they came from and we have your details, we'll be able to respond to them. Um, but we will be going through all the questions because it gives us a feel of how we should take the journey forward and what we should be doing in the future. But meantime, just to start summarizing what we've really been talking about today, it's been a, a, an exciting session um, full of stimulating um, different areas that we have to think about. This session was all about partnerships, positive partnerships. And as I mentioned at the beginning, assistive technology was an area we felt we wanted to focus on. However, you've probably heard that all the learnings and all the experiences that have come forward today actually are relevant for every area of our work. And so they can all be generalized to any area that we're all engaging with. So please take, do take her home those messages for your other areas of work as well. We heard from Wendy, who talked about creating an ecosystem of partnerships. And I love that word, ecosystem of partnerships, to boost impact. And, of, and that they are vital if we're going to leave no one behind in social and developmental change. Pratik, that, that, thank you to you. You told us um, how to embrace the power of millenniums, the power of M, that I'll never forget, uh, for creating partnerships for change across sectors and to think global in order to serve the local. Again, I love that phrase. Shona, thank you very much for your personal journey and you know, talking really about and sharing your, your personal experiences with such a large audience. Um, and that's how we learn from people like yourselves. And Shona talked to us about how partnerships are essential for holistic support solutions, creating inclusivity and bringing in new talent to enable scaling up of activity. And that again is really important, bringing in new talent. There's many of us who probably are at the other end of our um, coming, getting older in age. And so how do we actually recognize new talent and bring those young people forward? Um, to work with us effectively. Within the higher education sector, Cathy told us the vital role um, about cross-sector partnerships and shared her personal stories. So again, Cathy, thank you for sharing and, and making us all feel that, you know, we can have ideas and we can get somewhere with lots of cups of coffee, but with lots of friendships and people willing to actually come together and discuss innovative ideas. And actually, if we have a dream that we can get where we want to go. Um, you talked about um, creating innovation and meeting needs as part of your 80 20 30 work. And we really um, hope this um, um, just goes, flies with you, really, um, and you get the dreams that you've always been looking for. And we're all here behind you. Um, and Chapel, thank you so much. You gave so much of your time to us as well today. You talked to us about how partnerships enrich the actions of all participants, um, create win win situations, and better address problems. But really, in your final answers to your question, you talked about how we had to engage with the users, how everything has to be done with the people. And we, whoever we are, we can't live in our silos working separately. We must come together. We must remove our egos. We must talk about the we and not the I. So what are some of the take home messages? Well, COVID-19 presents some new challenges for partnerships, as well as opportunities for global collaborations. Digital technologies can be a solution. I think that's actually really important at the moment. We've been living through COVID and we're all on our computers, we're all on our phones. So how can actually 
you, how can we utilize digital technologies and move this um, agenda into the future? Partnership building, we talked again about all of the P's that we've talked about. Partnership building is so, so important. That's what we're here for today. So if all of you out there could think about how you could build your networks, um, do engage with each other, do engage with us, um, we can move on to try and um, move this narrative and this journey together to the next stage. Look for partners outside your sector. We talked about that, crossing the boundaries. Um, think about creative innovation, be innovative. And we've talked about scaling up and being rapid as well. I think sometimes in science, we want perfection. Um, and we have to also think about sometimes we have to have speed as well as perfection. It's important to agree on common goals, priorities, and to clarify our roles, particularly if you do not share the same values as your partners. But even if you don't, if you have a good narrative, you have a good dialogue as we are today, we can actually come to a common goal that we can all achieve together. We've talked about trust, totally. You know, without trust, relationships can't be built. We have to recognize that partnerships don't always last, last forever, and that's fine, that we don't have to worry about that. People come together at certain times and they leave at certain times, but that is fine. We shouldn't worry too much about that, but we do need to be prepared. Take the opportunities, be prepared. So some of the challenges for partnerships, what are they? Stakeholders are used to working in their own silos. We've mentioned that a few times today. We've talked about positive partnerships needing trust, and that takes time to develop. And But give it time. You know, it is hard work, but when, when, it, when you get it right, it's definitely worth it. They need to be nourished and managed. Some important components for us in the higher education and our role to think about. We need to recognize that we need to identify potential partners and look for innovators um, who we can work with. Invest in effective partnership management. Universities need to innovate, but we need partnerships to access the market and expand. And universities have a key role to play in public, private, people, partnerships. We've taken away lots of insights from you today. And people who know me, as you've heard, know that I also like other letters in the alphabet as well. And the one that many people will have heard today, but I can't not say them today because it's so important, are the four Cs. Community, collaboration, cooperation, collective action. If we do all of those, we have some pillars, can actually hold the house up that we want to achieve. I want to thank all the panelists today, Shona McDonald, Prateek Madhav, Catherine Holloway, Chapel Kaznabis, Wendy Walker. Thank you for giving up all your time. Thank you to you, the audience, who've actually engaged with this session and given up your time as well to listen to us and take the time to send us questions. But thank you also to my team who are behind the scenes, who have actually worked very hard at UCL to make today um, and a wonderful session for you all. We have some next steps. The next steps for our work are that we want to collate all the information from today's sessions. We want to really put a report together that we could then share with many people in the future. We will be collating all the answers. We will come back to you, um, whoever we can, with some of those answers. And we'll be thinking how we can facilitate some future networks into the future. We want you to keep engaged with us, keep the dialogue going, contact us um, if you can. We have um, a, um, and you could contact us on beyondboundaries at ucl.ac.uk. So please do do that and contact us for anything that you need to know more about. We have many more conference sessions going on for UCL Beyond Boundaries. Um, please do join the other sessions. And again, thank you to everybody. Keep in touch and I wish you well. Thank you.